Welcome to the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Welcome to another edition of the Vine Resources Podcast Show. I'm David Lawrence, your host, and I'm absolutely delighted today to have with me on the line Jeb Blunt. Jeb is so many things, an author of books, a leader of businesses, super, super successful. Um, most recently, one of the best books, best-selling books, um, Fanatical Prospecting. Jeb, thank you so much for joining me on the phone today. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here, and I'm grateful that you uh, invited me on your show. I'm so excited. This is fantastic. Thank you. Jeb, for our listeners who've never heard of you, um, how, can you just give us a quick little bit of an anecdote, a little story about who you are and uh, you know, a little bit of background about yourself and, and how you become to the, the, the person you are today? Yeah, I, well, I mean, basically, I'm a, I'm a sales guy. I've sold stuff my entire life. I realized early on that sales, even though some people we were, I was on a, a show yesterday, we were having a conversation about it. Some people don't see sales as a, you know, as a profession. For me, it's always been a profession because it's been the easiest path to the lifestyle that, that I wanted. So starting from, you know, my very early years, I was in sales. I ended up uh, working for a, a really large Fortune 500 company, sold for them, basically blew, you know, blew the doors off of all of the records and then progressed through that company until I was vice president of sales. And then back in the uh, 2006, I started my company Sales Gravy. And 11 years later, we're a global sales training development, sales acceleration company. We provide consulting. We do, uh, you know, projects like building out new hire onboarding processes and playbooks. We license our training content to learning and development and sales enablement groups. And we've, we've, we're growing rapidly. We're a hyper growth company, which is a company that's growing at greater than 40% a year. And in fact, we're doubling the size of our company every year. And, you know, 11 years later, we're knocking on the door of moving towards $25 million in sales U S which is a, a pretty big deal along the way. I've written nine books and I've got number 10 that'll be out in the fall and then number 11 that'll be out next year about this time. And, uh, and I, I'm lucky. I, you know, I, David, I, I have this, the greatest job in the world. I, I travel a lot. So I spend about 300 days a year on the, on the road because I'm speaking to groups and training, which sounds like a lot to the to, to folks. Uh, but I pitch myself every day because I get to do what I really, really love to do. And, uh, and that's, that's a rare thing I think in, in the world for a lot of folks. And, uh, but I love it. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm very fortunate. And, uh, and, and I, and I'm grateful to all the people that read my books because those are the folks who make this, this lifestyle pro possible. Now you mentioned there that you, you're on the road a lot. And, and what I love about that, of course, is you're in the trenches on the ground, seeing what's happening day to day. What, what do you see as the differences and maybe you, the differences between perhaps the corporate companies you engage with and the smaller SME companies in what's stopping them from, from, from selling? That's an excellent question. The, the, the difference between SMEs and, and the corporate world are SMEs a lot like my company. So I grew up in big fortune 500 company and now I run, you know, a, a small company and, and, and I've, and I've progressed all the way through. So I have a lot of empathy for these folks, but a lot of times a small, a small company, it starts out with an owner. The owner's got to sell in order to uh, accomplish their goals. The owner typically is a savant. They just know how to do it. Sometimes it's just grind. Like they just got to do it because this is, the, you know, the only thing that stands between them and the poverty line is them selling something. So you have, you don't have a lot of processes and you've got, then they, they're, you know, they, they, they bring a salesperson on and there's not a lot of management. So your, your, your sales organization grows up in, in sort of a chaotic way without a lot of processes. And, and that can be a good thing and a bad thing. But most of the time when we're engaging small companies, it's when the company hits a plateau and is ready to go to the next step. And we, we're, we're an sales acceleration company. So we typically with small companies, we're doubling, tripling, quadrupling their sales in a very short period of time by bringing in some of the things that large companies do. So what large companies do is they have a process, they have systems, they have the ability to hire really top tier talent because 
they've got the resources to provide salaries and and benefits and things like that that the small companies can't. So small companies tend to cobble together a group of what I call misfits, and and we're, my company is no different. I tell people all the time we're a group of misfits. We're just people that didn't fit into every other place. We came together for a common purpose, and we're really good that way. Where bigger companies are more homogenous, and that they're they're they've have you know, standardized tests, you know, all the things that they do. So we take some of those concepts, bring them to small companies without destroying the small company culture and environment and drive. And that allows small companies to move faster. Now, big companies, the problem that they face more than anything is, is that their, their processes, training, those, t t those things tend to be a little bit more contrived. So what happens is when you're a big company, you offload training and development either to HR or to a sales enablement group, most of whom and the people in those groups who are, have great intentions, well-meaning, fantastic professionals, but they never really sold anything. Like you mentioned earlier in the trenches, and I get up every day. I'm just like my team. I'm selling stuff every day, and I've sold stuff my whole life. But in a lot of cases, those people haven't sold anything. And it's not uncommon for me to find an HR manager building new hire onboarding for salespeople. They don't have a clue what it looks like. They're just building it because the boss says to do that. So when we're working with larger companies. It's getting them back to their roots and focusing on what really drives sales and connecting with salespeople where they are and not disrupting what they're doing, but, but it, making it better and making them move faster because big companies tend to slow down. They get, they get in the glue of the bureaucracy and it's removing those barriers so they can go faster. And where my team plays that role is we're really more facilitators or an extra set of hands so we can move things along or get things done faster and just help people get grounded. And if you've read my books, you, you, you know that, you know, my books are, are, are real. Like I don't, I don't, there's not a lot of philosophy. It's like, this is how you get it done. And we take that same spirit into our larger companies. That that's actually a great point. And also what I love about particularly the book is, well, I, I listen to it on audio and I, I probably put it on three or four times a week and just bung a couple of chapters on, on, on the way to the office, just that constant reminder. But how do you get people, whether that, you know, if they can't bring you in as a trainer directly and they've listened to the books, how do you get people inside of organizations who perhaps are experienced, but they've lost their way a little bit? Um, you know, they perhaps haven't bought into trying these things again now. But how, do, how does someone who's listened to this today get people within their organization to buy in, to, to roll back up their sleeves, to change? Um, because that's, that's a really big challenge for organizations. It, it is, and it's one. It's a challenge for us as trainers. So sometimes we'll be working with a company, and they say we want to do a pilot, and we go great. And then they want to send us all of the people in their organization who are a little long in the tooth. They've been there for a while. They are, as people say, stuck in their ways, and they want to send them to us to get us to change their mindset so that they will start doing things differently. And that never really works. You can't argue another person into believing that they're wrong, nor can you train them into changing their mindset. That happens through leadership. So the best way for you to change the way people are operating or help them reconnect with the basics, or especially when people just get burnt out and tired, they've been doing the same job for a long time and it gets really easy for them. And that's usually what happens. It just gets easy. So people start per stop performing at a really high level. They just perform at just enough. That, mm -hmm. that requires leadership. So typically where we start in those situations is through our sales coaching programs, so coaching ultra high performance. So we, we begin with leaders first. And I'm working with an organization right now that is starting to see that pickup. It's a, you know, what I would say a old line organization. So it's not, you know, software or technology or things that are really sexy. You know, it's, it's an organization that's been around for a really long time. They've got a great customer base. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. They sell the bread and butter of our economy. The problem is, is that a lot of their sales force was aging. When I say aging, you know, moving into their late thirties and forties that the, they, they were, uh, you know, basically resistant of getting back to the basics or prospecting or doing things differently. So in that situation, when, when they called us up and said, can you bring training in? And we did an assessment of the organization. The first thing we did was say, training is going to waste your time and, and waste your money. And we don't want your money. 
let's begin with teaching your leaders to get in the trenches with your people, to build better relationships with them, to coach, to help them set goals, to focus on targets, to, to in some cases, move people out that need to get out of the organization, but most people don't need to, but, but start leading. Then we'll apply training, and then the leaders will come back along and anchor the training. And that's exactly what we've done. And it's taken about, we're about four months in, and they are experiencing growth. They're starting to see an upward movement. They're seeing a change in the culture. It, and, and it's working. Now, this is, this is a process that we're applying over a whole year's you know, time. So it, we're at the very beginning of this process, but you're already seeing that happen. And, 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 and if you're listening to this and you're a business owner or a leader or an executive, it always begins with leadership, and which is one, one of the reasons why – even though Fanatical Prospecting is a worldwide bestseller, it's uh, argue, arguably the, the best-selling book in sales you know, over the last 20 years, that's not typically where we begin our relationship with customers. I wrote a book called People Follow You, and, and our coaching program is based on that book. Uh, our, our number one entryway, our number one best-selling uh, training program is Coaching Ultra High Performance because that's where – everything begins. You, you get your leaders right and your sales team will follow. Jeb, what are you doing from the top within your organization, particularly around the sales uh, element of the organization, really to keep those people engaged? And how have you seen that changing? Or has it indeed changed over the last five to 10 years? Well, I don't think engagement has changed. We, we throw a lot of um, mud at millennials and say millennials are not engaged or not this or not that. You know, I go back to leadership. Engagement is personal. You, you yeah. can be engaged in the organization. That's a leadership thing. Um, so, you know, creating a great message for leaders, for, for your organization. But, but it's, the, it's the one-to-one relationship with the human being and their leader that drives engagement more than anything else. And we know that most of, you know, most of people's, desire to to follow direction to take coaching is based on the relationship with their leader two basic questions does, does this person have my best interest at heart if they do i'm willing to follow you and and are you in in, in a, a person that can put me in position to win if you are they'll follow you now in my own organization, we're a fast-moving organization. Uh, we're, you know, we're adding people as quickly as possible. I've got the same problems every other small organization has, and that is that we we grew past uh, my competence to manage the organization on my own. So what I'm doing right now, specifically, is I'm bringing in an executive team. So I just brought in Jody Fogel. She's our CSO, a very successful sales professional built her own business that she sold very successfully to another company and she's helping us out. We're bringing in people like Robin Lyons who we were able to, to grab from a larger company to bring in to run um, our uh, business development organization and licensing. And, you know, Robin sold uh, by herself almost a billion dollars over the last couple of years. Keith Lubner on my team is run, runs our global consulting business. So we're bringing in these executives who in my team can apply that leadership. We're also, as an organization, focusing on what we, what we preach to small organizations is that we've got to start streamlining our organization and building better processes that allow us to speed up. So one of the things that, that we, we put our sights on was hitting $25 million in sales. And, and we, we recognized that even though we weren't at a plateau, the plateau was coming, uh, a lot of it because of me, I'm in the way because I built the business and I know where everything is. So now we've got to create standardized processes, things that are repeatable inside the business and help everybody understand what their job is. So in fact, this coming weekend, we have a big retreat. We're taking people completely away from our city. Uh, we're putting everybody on you know, planes and trains and automobiles. It's costing a lot of money to do this, to spend four days together so that we can jump off to the next you know, to the next place. And we've been doing this regularly and it's, and it works. So, so as a small business to stay focused on sales, to stay focused on revenue, we have to have great leadership. We have to make sure that we've got a very consistent message about who we are and what we want. We need repeatable processes and systems that allow us to move faster 
that lubricate the rails that we're running on essentially. And, 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 and we need to sometimes stop, slow down in order to speed up, which is a really difficult thing in a small organization, much easier in a big organization where you have the resources to do that, much harder in a small organization where everybody is pulling a load and slowing down sometimes means that you, that you, that you have to take a break from some of the things that you think are an imperative. So all of that together, bringing it into our organization, and it probably doesn't surprise you, David, that we're, you know, we're not unlike carpenters and home builders and plumbers and electricians and those type of people who spend a lot of time fixing other people's houses and, and then sometimes have a hard time fixing their own home. And we're, yeah. we're in a similar situation. We spend most of our time fixing other companies. And sometimes we have a hard time turning our eye back on ourselves and making sure that, you know, our company is running at the same level as our clients. And, and, and that's, an, you know, that's an honest thing to say, but I, you know, but I, if, if, you know, if you're listening to this as an organization, you know, as another company, I think you have to be able to be transparent and honest about your company in order to grow because awareness essentially is the mother of change. Jeb, I love that. And it's great to hear, you know, the challenges that you're going through as the business evolves and changes, but also what you're doing to, to put that right. So I really wish you the best on that four day uh, get together with your company. Um, to, I just want to talk about inbound and outbound. Now, I, I'm a HubSpot user, by the way. So I went to Boston last year to outbound. I didn't get to, uh, sorry, to inbound. I didn't get to outbound. And I'd love to just know a little bit about what, what, what you've been doing there and, and, and how, you, how that can resonate with people who are a little bit nervous about outbound and, and pushing out and, and, and interrupting decision makers. Yeah, so we built, uh, my, my buddies, uh, Anthony Anarino, uh, Mark Hunter, Mike Weinberg, myself, we founded Outbound uh, three years ago. And we started off as a little conference. We brought 300 people or so to Atlanta. Uh, we sold the thing out. Then we did it again last year. We doubled the size of the conference, almost 700 people. This year, we're, we're, we, we, sold, you know, we sold the thing out again. This year, we're moving to the Georgia World Congress Center, and we'll, we'll have 12 to 1,500 people there. And, and it's not a, a dissimilar path than the inbound that HubSpot put together, although inbound is focused around the HubSpot product, but they started off really small, and they built and built and built. And... I believe that inbound and outbound together are amazing. If you if you can combine the two things, you can you can really accelerate your growth and you have to have both. The problem with inbound is that you can never provide enough inbound leads to feed a hungry sales team. And the problem with, with outbound is that outbound is really tough and it's grueling and rejection dense work. So if you have an inbound component, it can make things a little bit easier, it can create familiarity, that type of thing. So we built Outbound as um, as a conference that focuses primarily on pipeline productivity uh, and on prospecting. So the whole thing's focused on that. And a core message that you'll hear is this. Yeah, I know that Outbound is tough. I know that prospecting sucks. I'm not a person that will tell you it'll you know just get over it and go do it. Uh, I'll tell you you have to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to sub-optimize your income. I'll tell you if you're a company, there is no way that you will ever grow um, as fast as you need to grow if you only rely on inbound. And I have this conversation with CMOs and, and CEOs every single day, and they all get it. Everybody gets this. I, I, don't, I don't believe that there are businesses out there that are under the delusion that they can go only inbound over the long haul and hit their goals. So everybody recognizes that there has to be some outbound. So what we, what we teach at Outbound is essentially that Outbound is freedom, and it really is. Outbound is your ability as a sales professional, as a business, to, instead of relying on what might happen, like, instead of relying on what shows up in your inbox or what comes in through a web form, you can pick up the phone and you can make your own way. You can create your own future. You can, you can, you can achieve any target you want because there is no limit to Outbound. There, there's a limit to inbound. But no yep. limit to outbound. And, 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 and if we look at today's sales world with social media and uh, with your ability to, to almost run your own inbound campaigns as a sales professional, if you're in a really large company, I don't recommend that. They'll probably get you fired. But if you're in a smaller company, you do have the ability to leverage some of the tools that are out there. We're, we're big HubSpot users at my company. I love HubSpot. Uh, it's my, it's, I've been a HubSpot user since 2009. By the way, I bought HubSpot on a cold call, a pure cold call. One of their people called me up in the middle of the day 
and got my attention and I bought HubSpot from that cold call. So HubSpot, an inbound company, sold me on an outbound call. So, if, but if you are a salesperson in today's world, you recognize that, look, between social media and your ability, if you have that type of role to produce content and to do some of the things that, that we do in a pure inbound sense, and what CMOs do really, really well, that it ought to be a combination of the two things. The problem that we face these days is that there are a lot of people in the marketplace who pander to your insecurity over outbound and tell you that you don't have to do it. And, and I'm here to tell you that you have to do it. If you want to optimize your revenue or your, your income as a sales professional, and that's my goal, I want to make as much money as I possibly can. If you want to do that, then you need to turn to outbound, get good at outbound, because when inbound's not delivering for, for you, you will always have a pipeline. Thanks for that, Jeb. Yeah, and you're absolutely right there. Um, how, how, how do you see the industry changing? And I talk about the sales professional industry changing over the next few years. And how do you think that'll affect your ability or, or people who are listening to this? How do it affect their ability to attract and retain the right talent? I, th those are, I think, two different uh, questions. So let me, let me, let's take the, the talent issue. So the talent issue is becoming a real problem because, at least here in the United States, and I know in Europe, the economy is starting to pull back just a little bit. So the ability to get good talent really is driven by the economy more than anything else. I met uh, a, a gentleman last week in San Francisco at one of my clients who is the, the, the manager for a, a, a really you know, cool um, sales development team. And I sat down with him and asked him, like, how did you get here? What were you, what were you doing before this? He says, I was driving for Uber. So, and he's talented. This, like, this cat crushed it. That's how he got the leadership role. So, you know, we're, we're out there looking for all this talent that has all of these, you know, bells and whistles. And this cat who, by the way, his, his uh, head of sales hired him. His head of sales is really, really smart, really intuitive. And he hired a human being that can get along with other human beings. So when we think about that, we ask that question, we think about from a technological standpoint, are we going to find people that are going to be able to work inside this, you know, this technological minefield or wave that is rolling over sales? And the smart sales leaders are looking for human beings that can manage tech and integrate tech and at the same time deal with other human beings because sales is human to human. And until robots start buying from robots, that's how it's going to be. Now, are there some things, of course, that – People trust enough to buy online without a salesperson? Absolutely. And the number of things out there that people will buy without a salesperson intervening will continue to grow as they have for the last 100 years. But as we, as we look at the complexity of sales, as we look at solutions, as we look at business outcomes, you need salespeople to guide that. And salespeople, are gonna, salespeople who deal with other humans are going to have that ability. What's changing in sales and why is this connected to talent? Well, in sales right now, there is a technological wave that is rolling over the industry. And, and, and that wave is allowing us to, to integrate tech in our lives to take away some of the drudgery of sales. It can, it can do things for us automatically that we couldn't do before. Those are good things. And it's the sales professionals that are able to integrate tech so that they can focus on human relationships that are going to win in the future. And our business, in fact, has shifted. Even though we help companies with digital transformation, and it's a big part of our business, as an organization, our focus right now is on teaching human-to-human -human skills. It is the one thing that's being left out in this equation because we, we focus so much on tech, on social media, on inbound marketing, on all of those things. What I'm looking at in the future of the next, say, four to five years is that the sales professionals who have or able to develop high levels of emotional intelligence, emotional control, human influence frameworks, who understand how to pivot and focus on the person who can build business outcomes and, and do so through better questions, uh, through connections, through building trust. Those are the people that are going to own the future. And by the way, that's true for every single industry. The people who are able to integrate tech so that they can spend more time with human beings who have a higher degree of emotional intelligence, those folks are going to own the future. They're going to have the greatest incomes, and they're going to be the ones who, um, who are able to, um, to speed up and accomplish far more than anyone else around them. 
Jeb, that is amazing. And look, you've just given so much value in this in this half an hour segment. So I'm I'm really grateful for it. A final question: If you if you had your time again and you were looking back now and giving your twenty year old self advice, what's the one thing that you'd say to yourself now? Oh my gosh! You know, <laughs> I I love it when people ask me that question because it just you know I, it like there's so much stuff. I mean, David, oh, I've made so many mistakes, you know, so I can, I can go back and find a million things. But I can tell you the one thing that I wish I would, I would have done if I could go back to my 20-year self. I wish that I had um, – there was two things. I'm not going to give you one. So one thing is I wish I had slowed down and savored some of the moments more. I, 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 you know, I think that in my, in my 20s and, you know, all the way through my mid 30s, I was so focused on my ambition to grow and to get promoted that I just didn't step back and, and embrace and enjoy some of the moments that were so good because I, I wish I could go back and live them over. I've had a really good, you know, the last 20, 30 years have been amazing. Uh, but if there's one piece of advice I would have given myself at the age of 20, it would have been be an entrepreneur and do it earlier. Uh, because the one thing that I that I'm running out of right now is time because you know I'm getting older and there's so much that I want to accomplish and so much that I want to build and I have great you know great confidence in myself as an entrepreneur now that I that I didn't have in my 20s that's why I went to work for somebody versus working for myself and and of course, and I'm not saying that entrepreneurship is for everyone everyone you have to find the path that's right for you but entrepreneurship was right for me I just I found a company that allowed me to act as an entrepreneur, but it wasn't my company. And I just, if I could just go back and do it all over again, I would have started down this path way earlier. <laughs> Fair enough. And well, you've had a good ride as well, so you cannot complain. Um, <laughs> Jeb, thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining me. Jeb, what is the best way for people, if they want to connect with you, reach out to you, find out more about you, how can they do that? Really easy. I'll, I'll give you my email address. It's uh, jeb at salesgravy.com, J-E-B at salesgravy.com. Uh, please don't turn your automated email on me and spam me, but if you'd like to reach out, that would be fantastic. Uh, my, uh, my phone number is 844. That's plus one for the folks in, uh, in Europe uh, or the rest, of the, the rest of the world, but 844-447-3737. And of course, you can catch me on uh, on LinkedIn. That's a great place to connect with me. You can uh, you can catch me on Twitter. I'm at Sales Gravy. Instagram. I'm at Sales Gravy. Facebook. I'm at Sales Gravy. I'm on YouTube, so uh, I've got tons of videos. I put two three videos up a week. And if you like podcasts, and I love podcasts, um, you can also catch me on iTunes or Stitcher. Just type in Sales Gravy, G R A V Y, and you'll find me there. Jeb, you are an absolute machine. And uh, for those who haven't read the book, Fanatical Prospecting, I'm sure it's in Amazon and everywhere else. And I've got it on Audible. Um, you know, my wife's heard your voice a million times now. So uh, things might be having an affair with you. Uh, <laughs> Jeb, thank, thanks so much for joining us. And look, I wish you the best and hopefully see you at the, uh, the, next, uh, the next Outbound. Thank you, David. I will look forward to seeing you there as well. All the best.